Hey everybody, it's Brian Mallow and this is But Seriously with me. And a special guest, you know, you already know, if you know me at all, that I that I really am intrigued by insects and love most insects with a couple caveats, a couple exceptions. Uh, I've never been a fan of the cockroach growing up in Texas. I don't, you probably wouldn't be either. Uh, maybe it could go either way. You either hate them or become a huge fan of them. And maybe that's sort of the same uh, situation here because one of the most dreaded insects um, and by a pretty solid definition, the most dangerous animal on this planet is the dread mosquito. And no, no, who likes mosquitoes? Well, I think we're about to meet a guy who maybe likes mosquitoes. At least he has dedicated his career to uh, studying them on a on a on a on a very deep level. So um, let's let's bring him in right now, Chris Potter. Um, Chris, uh, thank you so much for being here. Good to be um, here. Yeah, I, uh, oh, let's get rid of that little extra thing. Um, Chris is a neuroscientist and genetic engineer. He's a professor, an associate professor of neuroscience at Johns Hopkins University uh, School of Medicine. And his area of specialty is using tools of genetic engineering to probe the mosquito brain and specifically um, this very crucial to our relationship with them, their sense of smell. So olfaction, the olfactory sense. Um, so Chris, um, you know, the, the, the reason uh, we're here today is I saw a press release from Johns Hopkins Medicine about your latest research. So um, why don't we touch on that and then we'll jump into some background. But um, what, what is your, what, what, tell me about the nature of your research uh, what your lab is doing and what your latest uh, paper is about. Sure, yeah, it's great to be on here. Yeah, um, So my, my lab is interested in mosquitoes. We're one of the few ones that actually do like mosquitoes um, and enjoy so seeing them every like morning. <laughs> we, we like to hate them, I guess. It's a love-hate relationship that we have. Um, so what we've been doing for the last six years, seven years now is studying the sense of smell in mosquitoes. And the reason why we do that is that mosquitoes use their sense of smell for essentially every behavior decision that they make. And so we're hoping that by really understanding their sense of smell, we could guide them away from us, keep them away from us, so that would produce the amounts of bites that we get. Um, so that's our, that's our end goal. And so our, our, in our latest, latest work, we were trying a, this technique, this method, where we could genetically engineer their sense of smell that when they would smell us, they would essentially get repulsed by us. Usually they would smell us and be completely attracted to us. And right, so we who tried wouldn't to... be? <laughs> <laughs> but they're, they're carnivores and they, it's like, when, when you say our smell, what is the actual smell? What is it? Because I feel like what I'm coming to this with is this sense that I thought that they were heat seeking to some degree and that, and that there was something about CO2. Is that? Right. Yeah, so exactly. So they are heat seeking, they're humidity seeking, but, but primarily they're seeking out our odors. Then the first odor they pick up on is carbon dioxide. So we give off carbon dioxide when we breathe. I um, mean, is that an odor? Just, just it is pure odor. carbon yeah, it is dioxide, not carbon dioxide that's tainted by human? Like, so, so then, then aren't they confused by all the CO2 in the air? They are. So, so, the, so they detect they don't detect like CO2 that's in the air. They only detect slightly above that. So they have to essentially smell slightly above that CO2 in our air. Um, so, you know, the, the, raise, the rise of CO2 levels is, might be potentially a concern to mosquitoes because um, it's going to start really messing with their CO2 senses. Um, but once oh, they- Oh, right. Because it, right now it's like 0.4% of CO2 um, and they can detect, you know, just above that, like 0.6, you know, 1%. CO2. In our breath, when we give off, when we breathe, we have about 4% CO2. And so that really highly high concentrated amount of CO2 can actually go away from us from quite a distance. So that's what allows them to get activated to a human presence or an animal presence from quite a distance away. And so what this allows them to do, once they smell that CO2, they get the, they get the sense like, oh, 
there's probably an animal around here somewhere. So let me go see if I can find that animal. And that's when they become super attracted to our odors that we're giving off. And so the odors that we give off are a combination of things. There's, we're, not, we're not exactly sure what all the odors that a human gives off. Um, interestingly, a lot of the studies about human odors have come from NASA. Uh, because they're one of the few ones that have looked at, you know, an enclosed, in, an enclosed space, what essentially goes off into the air. And so NASA has done a lot of the original studies on what the odors are of humans. Um, but there's a combination of things. So there's lots of things that humans give off. And we're not exactly sure exactly what the perfect combination is to attract mosquitoes. Um, we think it's a, you know, it's these different things called carboxylic acid. There's different acids that were on our skin but it's a combination of your secretions that you normally give off, as well as like the microbiota that live on your skin. They take those secretions and turn them into other volatiles. So odors that can go away from your skin. And right, so, I was aware that, uh, and it's, it's, it's more mind blowing than it even appears to be at first, but the fact that our underarm odor, our, our sweat is odorless, but it's the bacteria that live in our underarm that consume some the sweat or something in it and it's what they emit that is the smell so the scent right. that is distinctively you isn't really you and the reason i feel like it gets mind blowing is because that scent plays a role in mate choice so if that's not even you but these bacteria these bacteria are playing a role in the course of human evolution right, right? well these but these bacteria they 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 live on your skin pretty, pretty firmly. So even if you were to bathe or to wash yourself, they're still in the pores of your skin, so you can't necessarily get rid of them completely. Ah. Um, so uh, they're they're there, and they're they're kind of like a part of you. <laughs> your little little friends that are living on you, um, but they you know contribute to your odor. And um, so and, you, you know, can't. So that's interesting. Like all the scrubbing with soap isn't there? Well, like. You'd have to scrub pretty darn hard to get it all off you, um, and it's they're they're not they're not going to hurt you, so it's not like you really need to get rid of them. Um, but it's just that they're the ones that also contribute to your your human odor. Interesting. So coming back to the mosquito and and this, maybe we will go a little deeper right now because I'm thinking of I'm wondering about this sensory apparatus and mm -hmm. how it detects CO two, mm -hmm. and then how it like so. It has to be sort of, I don't know if the right word is like normalized to this background level right. that shouldn't mean anything to it. So right. so what, what is the sort of mechanism? And right before the show, I had asked you, because of something I read, I had this impression that that the actual antennae were neurons or something. I mean, mm -hmm. they're sensors, and then right. you study this pathway of the right. neuron right. In, into the little tiny mosquito brain. Right. So on, so if you look at the antenna, they have these like very really long processes and they're sort of like tubes, these long tubes. And there's these little hairs that are sticking on these long tubes. And inside those hairs are where the olfactory, there you go, perfect. There's a picture right now on the screen of a side profile of a mosquito. And you can see that there's these long, long, long what look like tubes with these giant hairs coming off it. If you, were, if you could have zoomed in like super close to these antenna, there's tiny little hairs that are there. And inside those hairs, um, there are neurons inside those hairs, and that's where the olfactory neurons are. And so the mosquito has about 1,500 of these olfactory neurons that are covering um, these antenna. The part that responds to carbon dioxide is a separate part. So it's like this other stick-like thing that's coming off the mosquito called the maxillary palp. And on the maxillary palp are specialized neurons that just detect carbon dioxide. Um, so those are very super sensitive carbon dioxide detectors. And so That's... it's, if, and if, and if, even if you looked inside the brain, so these neurons, they target the brain. That's one of the th beautiful things about the olfactory system in us and in insects is that the neurons that are in our brain go straight to your, the neurons that are in our nose go straight to your brain. There's no relay station. There's like, it's one of the few sensory processes that doesn't go through like an, another step. It's goes straight. So then these <laughs> neurons are inches, several inches long or something. For these ones, yeah, these, uh, it does, yeah. Not in, in the mosquito, uh, maybe. In the mosquito, <laughs> much this is tiny, <laughs> a few centimeters, but they're still pretty long thinking that they go from that antenna and go all the way down that, in, that antenna structure and then into the brain. Yeah. Um, and you can actually see the ones that go into the brain for carbon dioxide, they take up a much greater space 
And so the space that hiccup inside the brain is usually correlated with how many neurons there are, how important that particular odor is to the mosquito. And you can see that carbon dioxide is a very important odor to a mosquito because the, the region, the processing region for the brain is pretty big for that. Um, and then when you mentioned that, that neuron, like even in us, so mm -hmm. the neuron goes from the nose, but then there's, it's attached, like it's not the neuron doing the, the odor sensing in us. There's some little apparatus there. Well, so the, uh, the neuron does the sensing. So there's, okay. there's these, there's on um, the, what's called the dendrites, like the, the ends of the neuron are where the odor receptors are. And so those dendrites have tons of odor receptors that are just covering embedded in these dendrites. And those are the ones that detect odor. So they're just kind of sitting there. And when an odor comes in and touches it, it'll activate those odor receptors. And then that'll send a signal down the neuron into, and in, then into the brain. So the, the human brain is so complex and do we have an mm -hmm. idea of how, how many neurons and then? <laughs> we, we, so we, we, we wondered this ourselves and so we tried to look for a number and we couldn't find it. So we just counted. Um, and so we did a, <laughs> there's like I, a, it's a real, it's how do you count, right? You just like one, two, three. Exactly. What you do that's is, gonna take a while. <laughs> that takes a while. So what you can do is you can essentially take the, the brain of a mosquito and you can homogenize it. So you could get it essentially into a solution that's, uh, it's called isotonic, isogenic, so that it essentially um, gets rid of the clumps. It's just in a solution. And then you can just count a small part of that volume. And you know, since if you counted a small part of volume, you know, since it's the same, uh, uh, density in that small part of the volume compared to large amount, you can just scale it up. You can say that in this small amount, we counted about 100. So that means in the full amount, it's about 200,000. And so that's what we did. And so in the mosquito brain, there's about 220,000 neurons. Um, about half of those are, are used for vision and the rest is used for all the other really complicated behaviors that a mosquito can do. So it can smell, it can taste, it can hear, um, it can, you know, it has like processes where it can know direction, it could figure out how to navigate in its, its world. It's amazing the amount of things that an insect brain can do. Yeah, it's that really, is always fascinating. Like For them to be so, these tiny, miraculous little machines, it's, it's almost inconceivable that they can have such elaborate behaviors. And mm -hmm. I actually, it had never even occurred to me to ask you about until just a few minutes ago to ask you about these other senses. So, mm -hmm. but you just said the, I, I, as, as important as smell is to the mosquito, vision takes up more brain space. Takes up more pro I think it's just because it's a much more complicated processing that mm. requ is required. Uh, to take something from the outside world and turn it into a picture is pretty difficult right. to do. So it does require a lot of neurons. To what do kind that. of eyes do mosquitoes have? If we come uh, back to You can to see that, this. yeah, you can, they're, they're compound um, eyes. So those little like circles that you can see is called an omatidia. So that's like a, like a one facet of an eye. And typically they have around 600 omatidia. So 600 little processing units. Um, so their vision is not the greatest. Um, it's, it's really, it's like kind of nearsighted in a way, you know, it's, it, you can't really, can't focus on large long distances, for example. But what, what, where insects and mosquitoes excel is the speed of their vision. And that's where, you know, all insects excel at that. So, you know, for example, we can see things at about 60 hertz, so about 60 frames a second. Um, you know, really, you know, what your brain is seeing, essentially seeing is single, single images and it, putting those together to, to make essentially a movie picture. And you could do that about 60 frames per second. Um, insects can do this about 250 to 300 frames per second. So they're seeing things way faster than, than uh, we're seeing them. So that's why it's so hard to swat a fly because you know they're seeing about four times faster than we are. Their refresh rate of their eyes are about four times faster than than ours. So when you're like you know moving your hand down to swat it to to the, the insect, it looks like in slow motion, <laughs> and that's why it has a lot of time just to kind of groom itself and then okay now I'll, I'll fly off because it's it's seeing things about four times faster than we do. That's amazing. Um, so, but, but help me understand this may be. Is it slightly how, how technical? We well, no, but but <laughs> in in video and film, I understand how why there are frames and how we get this 
illusion of, of, of constant motion from 24 or 30 frames or 60 frames a second. And I understand what the actual frames are, but what does that mean in terms of this biology? What does that refresh rate mean? It's, it's, actually, um, it's, yeah. a, it's essentially like um, if you, it's like what your brain essentially says is it's seeing is like one image at a time. So it sees an image, then it sees another image, then it sees another image. And so what it's doing is it's combining those into kind of like a movie in your head, right? So that you don't, you really see the, the world as static images, but then you combine them into see a, a motion in the world. And so, you know, what an insect can do is it could just see that refreshing, that refreshed picture four times faster than we can. And so that really just allows them to really be great at um, just temporal uh, vision, you know, that they can see things so much faster than us. Why, 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 aren't, why can't our refresh rate be faster? What's, uh, does it have something to do with the sun? I mean, is there also, since, well, especially when we get away from our head, there's so much distance involved and it takes time right. for impulses to move along neurons right. and, and the processing time. But yeah, so mosquitoes and insects are so small. Is right. that an so advantage it, here? Yeah. It's so, so they've used a different way of uh, um, getting visual input into the, the, the cells are essentially different than the cells that we use. And so um, in our, the, out, the, the cells that we use for our vision, are just a little bit slower. And so we're kind of already maxed out as what we can do in the vision in, in for us. But for insects, they use a different in, intracellular mechanism to do vision. And because of that, it's a lot, it's a lot quicker. There's not as much um, delay in the different steps yeah. that are required. So um, I want to come back to this research paper that you just published, and I know you're working on on, on another one already. Um, but but let me get a little background because I, I'm always fascinated by the academic path that somebody takes mm. to get to where they are, and I, I know that um, you've had an interesting and varied path. You got an undergrad in molecular and cell biology mm -hmm. at UC Berkeley. That's right. At Yale, you got your PhD in genetics. That's right. And then you did a postdoc in neuroscience at Stanford, and you've right. been at Johns Hopkins since 2010. Um, so is that, you just didn't know what you liked? Is that, or is that, <laughs> is that, or is that a logical path? Were you expanding? It's it's yeah. kind of semi-logical. So um, <laughs> when I when I started out, um, I always was interested in genetics and you know trying to figure out you know how a single cell gives rise to an entire adult organism. It's like it's I think it's just it still fascinates me how how that process works. And so when I was looking for graduate schools, I joined went to the genetics department because I thought you know I would really wanted to study this. And when I was trying to figure out what particular research topic I was interested in. I was interested in cancer research. I thought, you know, that would be an interesting topic to, uh, to, to get into. And the lab I joined, it just was fascinating because it was a, a lab that was using fruit flies to study cancer. And so what you could do, they're using these genetic tricks is that you can actually give a fly a tumor. And so you can have like this, you know, a fly that looks normal, and then it'll have like a tumor growing off it. And so you can actually do that experimentally. And so by doing that, you could look for genes that essentially give rise to tumors in flies, but it's the same kind, it's the same gene that would do this in humans as well. So you could use the fly as a model for studying cancer. And I thought that was super cool. Um, but it, during, during that work, you know, I really was interested in developing new tools and techniques and things in the fly. And so then when looking for a postdoc position, um, I was kind of searching around and there was this one group at Stanford, um, Leach and Lowe's group, who was just doing, I thought was the most amazing things um, in genetics, you know, they're doing new genetic tools and genetic methods, but also studying the olfactory system. And that was my first um, introduction to the olfactory system. And I kind of fell in love with it. There's so many amazing things that the olfactory system can do and, and does. Yeah, and yeah. So, let, let me stop you to say, like, what are some things that caught you about that? Like, I, I feel like the sense of smell, I don't know, it's it's a little underrated in some way. It is underrated. We have this, we hear <laughs> that we hear that our sense of smell isn't as great as, as a lot of other creatures that we're That's familiar not, with. Not, from... Yeah, it's not true. So I think we just don't rely on it quite as much. So um, our sense of smell is just as good as many animals. So we just, we just, just we just don't take advantage of it. 
Um, so, you know, our sense of smell is as good as a mouse, for example, is just that we don't bring things to our nose. Um, we don't, we don't, we don't crawl along the ground. Um, and so it's because of that. We, we don't just, greet we just, each we, other quite we the way don't dogs greet, greet each other. <laughs> if we did, it'd be an interesting thing, right? We can, we right. can pick up on a lot of things. So if you could, you know, um, a lot of, and I think that what we really use smell today for is our sense of our taste or flavor. Um, so, you know, right. Flavor really is a combination. It's, have, it's something that actually happens not on your tongue, but in your mind. And so what your mind is doing is combining what's happening on your tongue, which is just you know five different senses, and then what you're smelling. And so it combines those things in your brain into the sense of flavor. So a lot of the, you know, what you say, oh, this, this tastes amazing. Really what that is, is flavor. And all of that's coming from your olfactory sense. It's picking up all the nuances that are in a particular food. So I think that's, that's where, you know, our, where we really do actually use our olfactory senses still uh, is um, in those types of processes. When you, you mentioned the tongue and you said five senses, did you mean the, like the five the different? Sweet, the, yeah, the sweet, bitter, salty, umani. So those are like, there's receptors yeah. for each kind. Mm -hmm. That's a simple right. thing that's like only that kind of thing that's will, it, yeah. will right. trigger it. And then they're all triggered to whatever degree and then right, combined right. with information coming from the nose. Exactly. So when you're, when you're eating food, there's like a pathway that allows like the, those volatile odors to go back um, up into your nose. So when you're eating food, you're actually smelling it as well because the odors go back up into the, into your nose. And so that's where a lot of the, the nuances, the real pleasure of food comes from is from smell. Do you, Here's an odd question. I, I can't do extremely spicy foods. And mm. in fact, very spicy things, it's such a painful experience for me that I can't mm. accept that somebody else is actually experiencing the same thing. Is, is there an explanation? Do I have too many of a certain kind of sensor? Is there anything <laughs> like that? Or is it that really people just like that horrible burning pain of a little... <laughs> pepper burning through my tongue. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it's a, yeah the, that, that hot feeling you get is from activation of something called trip A1 channel. So it's a certain kind of uh, receptor that picks up on heat, but it also picks up on like spicy foods. And I, I don't know if there's like, if there's probably differences in people, but I think it's also cultural differences. I think if you could just, you know, if you grow up eating really spicy foods and you know, and you just come to love it, then you could really tolerate some really strong stuff. Um, but, you know, it could be that maybe there are differences about of trip, you know, trip channels that you have on your, on your tongue uh, that maybe you're just more sensitive to those types of hot chili peppers. So you're saying I'm not necessarily uh, wrong that there might well, be. <laughs> gotta toughen up a little bit, man. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, do I? But um, yeah, that's amazing. Um, yeah. So well, what's something else just about, about olfaction in general mm -hmm. that, uh, that just fascinated you? I mean, well, I'm I thinking think... right now it's like, I, 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 would, yeah. I've, I have always been fascinated by the fact that when you smell something, it's not like you're smelling something over there. Mm -hmm. And like this is, especially for things that are sort of repellent, it's like mm -hmm. if you smell it, then right. you're already it's it, it's, it's the our, stuff it's, right it's it's, it's not it's like a, the scent that says ooh yeah. it's a good thing we didn't step in it it's like oh it's already all over your face and in your mouth and it, right and it's and it's already in your nose yeah it's already there yeah. uh, so uh, so it, yeah you know one of the things I thought was fascinating when I was you know figuring out what what to do is that the way the olfactory system um, is wired and how it, it develops is amazing so. Um, each olfactory neuron expresses only one olfactory receptor. Um, and there's, you know, let's say there's like a million of these different ne these neurons in your brain, in your, in your nose, they're all expressing the same olfactory receptor. Those will all target the same region of the brain called the glomerulus. And so let's say there's three different odor receptors. There's in, in humans, there's about 380 odor receptors. Um, hmm. But each, each olfactory neuron that expresses the same olfactory receptor will target this one region of the brain. And so it's just a really fascinating developmental question is about how that actually happens um, and how these neurons essentially can find each other as they're going, you know, from the epithelium, how they're going from one, they're starting site 
into the brain, how they kind of sort themselves into this amazing process. It's, it's a beautiful developmental process that the olfactory system can do. Um, so that was one of my original attractions to it. And then I was also just attracted to, to, to the olfactory behaviors. It's such an innate sense. It's like one of our most primal senses. Essentially every, every organism on earth has some sort of olfaction, even like bacteria, because at its, at its basest form, olfaction is just the ability to detect chemicals that are in your environment. Right. And it's such an important thing to do that even bacteria do it. You know, they're not like smelling in the same way we can, but they're still detect detecting chemicals because these chemicals are indicating something important is happening in their environment. Yeah, I love that. I love thinking about this apparatus as evolutionary, biological or evolutionary technology. Right. That, right. um, for that, that like 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 sensory sensory apparatus for yeah. detecting, and and that's an interesting one because all the way down to single celled organisms, mm -hmm. it's relevant to them. So since you know, I was gonna say we have some great comments, and I want to say hi to Regina, but I'm saving your question for later, and I'll bring in Ron's question. Um, but but obviously, like smell is powerful and we do care about food and taste and it does evoke memory. So mm -hmm. smells can be very evocative. And Ron says that Michael Hutchins, he was the lead singer in in, in Excess, mm. uh, blamed the loss of his sense of smell for causing his depression that ultimately led to his suicide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because you, I think that's, so when you have a nausea or you lack of smell that you really appreciate how important it is, she is to enriching your life. That's absolutely true. You know, it, there's a lot of um, pleasure you can get, you know, from it. And when it's when you lose it, that's when you really notice that it how important it was. You just used the word anosmia, was it? That anosmia. I only uh, first encountered yesterday, and and I was reading about some of the long COVID effects, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. there's they're across the boards affecting mm -hmm. all different systems and parts of the body, cardiac problems and brain problems. But a lot of people are, you know, we've heard that as a symptom of COVID in the first place, mm -hmm. but a lot of people with even mild cases or hospitalized or not are later when they think that they're done with COVID right. experiencing. Um, and some of the, so anosmia. It's a is, complete lack of smell. It's and a complete lack of because because some of the people are also having that thing that sort of connects to what you told me about your current research, which is something some smells become too overpowering to them. Mm -hmm. So something like garlic or their garlic and something else, onions or something, things that they right. liked, all of a sudden become uh, right. annoying. So what was once a pleasant smell. Oh. And that's that sort of ties. That's right. exactly right. what your research was trying to do. Take a the pleasant smell of a bloody <laughs> juicy human and turn right. it into something annoying to the mosquito for our own sake, right? That's that's what we were hoping to do. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we're trying to like essentially scramble the olfactory system of a mosquito so that it no longer liked us anymore. Um, Why don't you tell me the the bit about? Um, what made you think that it might work that way because of your work on a previous model organism? Right, so we have we had done some um, previous work in Drosophila. So Drosophila are these little fruit flies, vinegar flies, um, and they're an amazing model organism for doing all sorts of genetic trickery. That's very easy to work with them. And so what we have done in Drosophila is we could take an odor receptor that was responding to a certain odor and put it in many different neurons in Drosophila. And so the neurons, the olfactory neurons that you put it into now respond to that odor that you want it to respond to. And so we thought, well, this, let's try this in mosquitoes. And so we picked an odor receptor that responds to odors that were on your skin. And so we put these in different olfactory neurons in the mosquito and the mosquito said, no, I don't, I don't think so. We're not, we're not going to let that work. And so instead of <laughs> activating neurons, they actually shut it, shut it down. Um, which was unexpected. So these neurons no longer worked at all. So it's kind of the opposite of what we expected. Um, but it suggests that mosquito, the mosquito olfactory neurons have a different mechanism inside of them for regulating how odorant receptors are expressed. So we're gonna, we're gonna pursue that further to figure out if we can essentially take advantage of that. Um, but it just indicates that, you know, we have a little bit farther to go to really trick mosquitoes um, in that particular way. And that was towards like thinking that you could develop a, an insect repellent. Yeah, but, that's what we were hoping, right? But well, whereas we were it hoping, might have worked, yeah. 
we were hoping that you know we could essentially just have a different type of mosquito we could change the mosquito itself so that it would no longer be attracted to us we could maybe guide it away from being attracted to us be attracted to something else maybe a dog a cow or something like that instead of us it's just once again uh dog is man's best friend but man is not necessarily dog's <laughs> best friend hey so by the way like i don't know how much you know about cat and dog brains but that idea of a pleasant a pleasant stimulus becoming overwhelming and unpleasant i i i'm kind of curious about if if that's related to this behavior in cats where they love being they are in the throes of your rubbing on them and they're purring and they're loving it and then without i mean i i think they do give some warnings but sometimes it seems without warning all of a sudden they just turn to i hate you and it's all claws and and teeth and it's like i thought you were loving it is yeah is, those are cats. I have a cat, so that's I know exactly what you mean. That, not the same thing. That's, that's just categorized under. I don't cats. think anyone. No one understands the cat brain. I don't think <laughs> it's a mystery to everybody. Uh, what actually one interesting about cats is that uh, there is uh, uh, catnip. You know that odor, yeah. that um, mint that cats just absolutely love. That actually turns out to be a really good insect repellent, uh, and so. You know, the one theory is that cats, when they're rubbing themselves on this catnip, they're essentially coating themselves with a really good insect repellent to prevent mosquitoes from biting them. Um, That's we had very a, interesting. We had a we had a paper last year for with Mark from a group of Marcus um, Marcus Stensmeyer, who determined that essentially this catnip is activating essentially this trip channels, the same ones that are actually activating those the capsaicin the uh, receptors. So it it might be that. For mosquito, this um, this catnip is actually maybe somewhat painful to them when they when they smell it, and that's what keeps them away. Uh, that's very interesting. And I was going to say, but but they obviously like get off on it. They seem to, but but that's that's the that's the thing. That's the system to make sure you do it. Right. So I think that maybe the reason you know it's maybe an evolutionary advantage for cats to love it so much because they could rub it all over them. Yeah. <laughs> It's what why it works like that in cats is not exactly clear. It's somehow stimulating um, their like a pheromone type of response, so that it kind of makes them a little a little high. Yeah. Uh, but you know, it it is also coating themselves in a mosquito repellent at the same time. So, so let me ask you: Have, have you did you always where, where are you from? Um, I'm mostly from California. Yeah. Oh, what part? Uh, I... Southern California. Las, yeah. Uh, San Fernando Valley. Okay. I lived in LA for a few years and spent a long time in San Francisco. Oh, yeah. Um so before I came here to Raleigh, but uh did you always know you wanted to be a scientist? Yeah, I did. I think I've always liked biology. I've always liked science. So like, you know, figuring out um answers to questions, you know, I love the discovery of it. Uh, I think that's just nothing better than doing an experiment and being essentially the first person in the entire world, entire history to have to see something. It's like a high, you know, it's just amazing just to think that for that one small moment in time, you're the first person to know something. And it's, it's just, it's a lot of fun. Um, so I just love that aspect of discovery and kind of just uncovering mysteries, um, uh, figuring out how things work. Um, you know, I think if I couldn't be a scientist, I'd probably be like a tinkerer of some sort. Um, <laughs> yeah. Maybe like a electrician or a plumber or something like that, just so I can keep my hands busy and um, tinker with stuff. I love that. And and I think that I always wish more people would understand that science uh, is like detective work and solving and just, and it's more about uh, asking questions and even more asking the questions than solving. But but you are trying to solve these questions, but as soon as you solve one, you move on to the next. And Right, right. Do you and have then, an example? Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. Sorry. Do you have an example of where you your personal experience of living that knowing something that no one like seeing something knowing something that no one knew yeah yeah absolutely it happens all yeah happens all the time first time was in graduate school um where i was looking at this uh this gene mutation in flies and we were the first ones to identify that this was part of a really um, important cancer pathway and so, you know, I was the first person to see like the experiments, the results that suggested, okay, this, this gene that we've identified that we're looking at 
is, a, is part of this really important cancer pathway that no one had really identified yet. And so it's, you know, it, it's pretty exciting uh, to do those types of things. Um, it's, there, there's lots of little experiments. You know, I think one of the things that, you know, good thing to be when you're a scientist is really just enjoy the little, the little things, you know, so when you do it a little experiment and it works, um, that always excited me as well. So I think just this constant optimism and uh, just really enjoy all the small victories is a really important part of being a scientist. Yeah. The optimism, were you always kind of optimistic? It's, I, I yeah. feel like I always was, although in recent years, maybe it's as you get older or it's just certain trends, whether it's the climate and politically, that sometimes mm -hmm. it's hard to maintain that, that youthful optimism. Yeah, I try to, yeah, I try to keep an optimistic, you know, at least in our lab environment. <laughs> uh, I think it's important because you know, experiments will work maybe one at a ton times. And so you just really have to, you know, figure out why didn't it work this particular time? You know, what can I, what, what small tweaks can I make to it? And then always think that, you know, you're going to, you're going to get there. You just kind of have to sometimes persevere and, and keep going. Um, but I, I really think that, you know, just putting the hard work in, um, asking the right questions, we'll, we'll get there. Well, yeah, I never thought about that. How many experiments don't work? Does that mean when you, <laughs> when you have work. one? Well, then if you have one and it does work, what does that mean? That it gave you a result yeah. that you expected or did like, does that mean, how do you know that that's the one that worked? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good question. Yeah, that's the, yeah, that's where, that's where the uh, importance of controls are. So when I mean say it worked, it's like, you know, the negative control didn't do anything. The positive control did something. And then your experimental showed you something yeah so yeah something when it when something works it's it's there's a lot of things that go into to proving to yourself that you're seeing what you think you're seeing right you know i think in terms of on, on a very different subject like the large hadron collider that for many years in its search for the for the higgs boson for many years it wasn't finding it mm -hmm. and there was this I, there's a probably a tendency for people that don't really uh, fully understand that if it never found it, that that would be a failure of this multi-billion dollar project. But it really wouldn't have been a failure. It would have, they would have, it would have been improving that it didn't exist in these places. So right. it's not the exciting result, but it would have been a result. It's just, <laughs> Uh, instead of finding it, we found it doesn't exist in those areas. Right. So what's the deal? So, so sometimes that science, like, it's not as simple as like, uh, did it succeed or fail? That's right, the, like right. what we call a success well, think, or a failure. I mean, a lot of times, like when something doesn't work, as long as you're sure that you did everything correctly, it indicates that there's something new there, that there's new biology, there's something new to be discovered. Because if you're expecting like a certain answer, answer A, and you keep getting answer B, and you've done everything right, it means that maybe answer B is the right answer. And so we were thinking answer A, but maybe it's really answer B. So why is it answer B? And it usually indicates that there's a whole set of new discoveries to be made because of that. So, you know, in, in many ways, I think as long as you set up the experiment correctly, you do all your controls, whatever answer you get out, um, regardless if it worked the way you thought it was, it's still something new, still important. Um, and so I think that's, you know, something to really appreciate is that, you know, there really is no like failures in that case, you know, as long as you did it set it up correctly it's it's not a failure yeah did you have any um uh mentors or uh people that inspired you along the way maybe before you got into the career or as you went that someone that that you learned something like this sort of this uh, uh, the way to be a scientist and this kind of perspective beyond yeah, just learning the right. facts yeah yeah I, th I think you know as for most it's like your graduate advisor and then your postdoctoral advisor advisor you you get to know them pretty well it's a pretty long relationship um and so i you know i i saw how you know clever they were um they're very insightful they always had very interesting questions um worked hard i think you know it's also very important um to be successful it's just to put the hours in um and so I, you know i think and then just meet people you meet, you know, at conferences and other scientists that are in the field. Um, I would say, you know, it, everyone is pretty a good, good, especially in my field is a good group of people. They're all, you know, um, interested in what you're working on and um, supportive. So it's, it's fun to be part of that community.
um, of, of scientists. So um, I think it's like, you know, the small victories that everybody has, I think are inspiring and how they were able to actually get those victories, even though, you know, science can be very hard. Yeah. Um, do you, is there something you wish more people understood about science? I think, yeah, I don't, don't, uh, don't believe everything you see on TV, on TV shows and, and those dramas. It's a lot harder than that. <laughs> <laughs> it takes a lot longer. You can't just go into the lab and, you know, five minutes later you have your result. Uh, doesn't, doesn't work that way. So um, it takes a lot of, lot of effort, a lot of uh, time invested. Um, but I think, I think also important just to realize that scientists are just regular people. Um, you know, I think a lot of there's this conception that scientists are super smart and, um, you know, they're smarter than just everybody else. And I think that's not necessarily true. Um, I'm certainly not. So I think it's more <laughs> just, you know, we have a certain interest in something and we're just willing to put the hours in into really focusing on it because we enjoy it. You know, just just like an artist is really interested in creating art and puts the hours into becoming better. It's just, it's a skill like anything else. So, you know, I think don't, you know, just don't be afraid of talking to a scientist, um, you know, that uh, this, there's nothing, you know, nothing to be afraid of, you know, they're just regular people and are happy to talk about science and just to kind of spread their, their knowledge about how it works. Yeah, I think that, you know, not everybody knows, I feel very spoiled. I know so many scientists mm -hmm. and some people really don't know any scientists. So it's hard for them. They can have these ideas of what a scientist is because they're not friends with one, um, possibly. But I, I do love, I, I like wonder what, this is like sort of what you just talked about, but what gets you up and motivates you? And I, I, I like in the morning to go, uh, do this. Um, did, did do you study mosquito brains to better understand human brains? Do you mm -hmm. study mosquito brains towards developing better insect repellents and right. lessening uh, malaria, or is it just the science for its own sake? Do you have these? It's, like, it's kind where, of a combination. What gets you to do the? What yeah. motivates you to do the work? It's kind of a combination. So I I enjoy. Um, just the discovery of it, just to identify, just to know how something works, you know, to really understand how the sense of smell works in insects. I think it's just fascinating, um, you know, how the insect that, you know, has neurons that can detect odors and how the, that signal gets into the brain and how the brain actually takes that information and does something with it. I think it's just a fascinating question. And, you know, on top of that, it's like, we can actually use that for the betterment of, for us, the betterment of humans. So we could really use our knowledge and really this basic understanding, this basic science understanding of, of mosquitoes, for example, to stop them from biting us. So that could make a really large impact. Um, half, the, you know, half the world's population is at risk for some kind of mosquito-borne disease. And so it's, it's, a huge, it's a huge issue. And so you know, combining this basic science research with you know, applications that we can actually use it essentially against the mosquito that's you know really gets me up in the morning um and trying to really figure out how this how this works and how we can actually use it for our own good yeah that's what i want to hear what motivated <laughs> you is the tools to go to war against the mosquito <laughs> yes <laughs> our enemy they drew first blood that's right oh you know what that's i'm just remembering some uh, an old bit from my act which it's like amazing when an insect lands on you because would you ever if, if there was something that much bigger than you, like a sandworm, if you like science fiction, I know you do, that like, would you ever land on something, and especially a mosquito, to land on something that much bigger than you with mm -hmm. the intention of eating it? Right. The <laughs> guts, the, like, but and how did you really think that was going to turn out? Very optimistic little mosquito taking on, well, like yeah. Luke Skywalker taking right. on the Death Star in a little X-ray right. fighter, you know? That's right. <laughs> Well, they're very gentle, right? So when they land on you, they they barely there's like there's a, some studies where they're trying to figure out like what's the force that's required for you to detect it, and yeah. they are just under it. So they have evolved the ability to just barely when you land on you to not apply enough force 
on even your skin. Even when they stick that needle in you. Well, even when they, that's when they could, you can start feeling it. You know, once they start drinking blood, then, then you start to feel it. But don't some, I don't know if some mosquitoes have this, but don't some biting insects uh, inject a little uh, anesthetic? They do, to right? Make it less noticeable. Yep. Yeah. Yep, exactly. Yep. So they have to. Oh, an anti anticoagulant so the so blood can flow. Doesn't clot right away. Yep. So it flows. <laughs> they're they're pretty sneaky. Very sneaky. So, okay. Um, I have a question here from Regina, and it's the same question that I think a lot of people have. Mm -hmm. My next door neighbor asked me to ask you this. Um, why do some humans, <laughs> let's call them my husband or my neighbor next door, Kim, seem to, oh no, they some rarely get bit by mosquitoes and some like me and Kim uh, get swarmed and bit a lot. Yes, my neighbor swears that, um, that in a group, mosquitoes preferentially uh, go to her. Um, is yeah. there any truth to this? Is there, there, we... there is there is truth to this. So um, there have, so that usually when you're trying to figure out if there's some kind of genetic basis to anything. Um, you do identical twin studies because identical twins essentially have the same um, same genes. Uh, and so you compare how attractive are identical twins to mosquitoes compared to like siblings. And sure enough, identical twins are more attractive. So they have about an equal amount of attraction to mosquitoes as like a sibling would. So that indicates that there is some kind of genetic component, that there is something about, you know, yourself that makes can make you more attractive. So that does suggest that there are humans out there that are super attractors and there are some humans that are less attractive. Um, I think in general um, to a mosquito, all humans are attractive, but when given a choice, you know, they do have preferences. So they're, you know, if, if your husband or your wife happens to be super attractor, that's keeping them away from you. Um, and so there's actually, there was a really interesting study that was just came out um, from Leslie Vossel's group at Rockefeller that was looking a little bit more into this. And they identified that there are certain odors that certain chemicals that are on our skin that might be connected to attraction. There's these things called carboxylic acids. Um, and it seems like those that are super attractors tend to have a slightly more amount, a little bit more abundance of these carbox carboxylic acids on their skin. It's, you know, it's probably not the only thing that are, is different about these super attractors, but we're, you know, we're getting there. Um, but, you know, the other thing to and consider is And do you think there's a gene associated with that, a genetic component to that? It's, we're not, we're not sure. It's, I think it's a, it's a complex chemistry. So it could be part of the microbiome that's on your skin mm -hmm. that does this, um, or it could just be a, the certain secretions that you're giving off we, we, that we don't know yet. Um, but what, you know, one, but one thing to, to keep in mind is that, um, it's a little, sometimes it's a little bit uh, tricky to, to know for sure because some people just don't react to the mosquito bites. And so it could be that you're just as attractive, you know, uh, to mosquitoes as another person, but you just don't react to the bites. You're just one of the lucky ones that doesn't react to a bite. So you might be just attracted getting bit and you just don't realize it. Um, and so, you know, you really kind of have to do, do tests to see, you know, your odors. You can you can put like a, for example, like a nylon mesh on your skin that captures like your the odors that are on your skin, and then you could do a test in the lab to see, you know, the odors that were on your skin are are these odors that we picked up on are those making are those super attractive to the mosquito or not? And that's the really best way to tell um, if you are you know more attractive to mosquitoes than somebody else. And I'm always curious about how we figure some things out, and I'm imagining. That in those twin studies, you had to you had to get sets of twins, and they had to be willing to be in a chamber and be exposed to mosquitoes, right? Right, right. <laughs> a lot of times, what you could so so the, the main thing about the, the mosquitoes that essentially give rise to human diseases is that they're super attracted to humans, and so you don't even have to put the human in the cage necessarily. What you can do is you could just have like an air flowing over a human arm, for example, that goes into like a setup where the mosquitoes can smell it, and they can have like a choice between left, right, or, or like two different like two tunnels that they can go down. You know, one tunnel is getting the odors from one person, the other tunnel is getting the odors from a different person, and then they'll be able to decide which tunnel do they want to go down. And so that's where you can kind of start looking at preferences, you know, which the odors that were in this tunnel, are you, do you want to go down that tunnel versus the other tunnel? And that's how you, so you don't even have to put the person in the, in the same room as the mosquito, you just have to get their odors in there. And are the mosquitoes loose or do you ever do those sorts of experiments where the insect is immobilized 
but you can tell which direction it wants to go. Yeah, yeah. So we we haven't done those in our lab yet, but yeah, you people have done those with mosquitoes, and so you can actually stick them on a since you put them on a stick, a mosquito on a stick experiment, and then you can look at their wings, <clears throat> and you can actually see um, just based on like which which way the wing is trying to fly, if it's trying to fly towards like an odor source or not. Well, that's interesting. And uh, if we come back over here, but that's not a picture by, this is a picture from your lab. Um, <laughs> what's going on here with this uh, immobilized right. uh, so mosquito? So what we have here is we have a mosquito, a female mosquito that we've put into a pipette tip. And so she's kind of shoved into the pipette tip so she can't really move. Um, and then we have her antenna pinned down on a slide. And so that's like those long stick things that you can see okay. sticking out. That's her antenna. And what we've done, this is like a, a mosquito that we've specifically genetically engineered so that it'll express something that when the olfactory neuron is activated, those neurons will glow brighter. And so what we can do for this particular mosquito is we can actually puff on odors and see like certain neurons are activated by those odors or not. We can actually visualize it directly. It's, it's amazing. So it's, it's like, uh, you know, looking at little fireflies, you know, lighting up in the dark, you can kind of see where the neurons are that are activated by a certain odor. Yeah. And so th That's... these are the kinds of experiments we've done to try to figure out how insect repellents work. So you can take it. So you can go to like the drugstore, for example, and you can see that most of the insect repellents you see at a drugstore are as DEET is the main one. That's the primary insect repellent. And there's a few others that you can buy. There's one called IR3535, which just stands for insect repellent 3535. Real one catchy name. <laughs> so I'm so surprised creative. it's not flying off the shelves. Is, uh... what, ha you know, what happened to insect repellent 3434? <laughs> um, so then you have like uh, Picardin, and then you can also have a natural repellent. So these are repellents that are usually derived from some kind of plant oil. Um, oil and lemon eucalyptus is a pretty good one. Um, uh, then there's some other, you know, citronella and things like that. And so what we could do is we could just, you know, the mosquito that you, we, we can essentially puff these odorants onto the mosquito and just see what happens to its olfactory neurons. Because the whole idea behind insect repellents is that they're essentially repelling the mosquito. There's an odor that repels mosquitoes. And when we did that with these Anopheles mosquitoes, so these are the mosquitoes that you would find in Africa and in Asia, we found, we were actually pretty surprised that when we puffed on DEET, for example, um, it didn't actually activate any of the olfactory neurons on the antenna of the Anopheles mosquito. And so what we determined, you know, from lots of different experiments is that what DEET is doing is it essentially kind of keeps your odors trapped onto your skin. And so it prevents the odors from your skin to from essentially become volatile and going to the mosquito itself. So mm. it, it kind of hides your odors, masks your odors from the mosquito. Um, so that was that was a kind of a surprise. But you know, we can we can actually use this to identify the odor, the neurons. Like for example, oil lemon oil of lemon eucalyptus, which kind of has like a a lemony odor to it, um, works pretty well as an insect repellent. And so we can see the neurons that are activated by that directly on the mosquito. So that's you know the work we're doing now is trying to capture those neurons and to figure out what are the odor receptors that were activated by that, because those were you can kind of think of those now as drug targets in a way that you know, we have a receptor, we have a, simply a molecule, this receptor that will respond to these repellents. That's the cue that the mosquito is using to keep away from us. And so we can then identify, if we can screen for more chemicals that would work better for that process. So we can, our hope eventually is to create like the super repellent that will you know, keep mosquitoes far, far away from us. So, so did you just say that, that DEET was being used before we fully understood the mechanism by which Oh yeah, it absolutely. Operated. Yeah, yeah, yeah we, that's true of a lot of yeah. things, I guess. <laughs> we, 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 we didn't know what DEET was doing for a long time. So DEET was identified in a screen. So this was in, in 1940. So this was a response for World War II. A lot of American soldiers were going overseas and just getting ravaged by malaria. And so the US Army, USDA set up a screen to look for chemicals that would work at repelling, repelling mosquitoes. And from that screen, um, the way that the screen worked is that they would put chemicals on someone's arm and then shove that arm into a cage of about 2,000 80s aegypti mosquitoes and then just see after three hours, you know, after, after leaving the chemical on for three hours and putting it into the cage, did, you know, how many bites did that person get? And so DEET was identified that way based on its activity. You know, it was known that if you put this chemical on your skin, 
you know, even after waiting three hours and putting your putting your arm in a cage, it'll protect you from getting bitten. Um, but so it was it was found because it had this amazing activity, but nobody really knew for 50 plus years what DEET was actually doing that gave rise to this particular activity. Wow. Yeah, that's wow. really interesting. And 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 also like they're so isn't it isn't it possible to develop something that clogs the receptors on the mosquitoes antennae? I mean, yeah, I'm, sure. first, I'm not the first person to think of that. Yeah, no, it's, so so an interesting thing is that you can actually make mutants um, in mosquitoes that will take out certain parts of their ability to smell. Um, and so so, you know, thinking that if you get rid of like this one aspect of its sense of smell, you're done. You know, the game over, the mosquito won't find you. And so these were experiments were done um, in Leslie Bossel's lab and others, where you, you essentially mutate a mosquito and it no longer can, the most, a lot of its olfactory senses are no longer working. And much to everyone's surprise, those mosquitoes were still able to host seek, meaning they were still able to eventually find a human. And it's because the mosquito has multiple backup systems. So they have like a primary olfactory system, but then they have a secondary olfactory system that will really kind of kick in and still allow it to find a human. And then it still has those carbon dioxide sensors, which will still help find a human. You know, so, you know, mosquitoes have all these, it's, it's, it's all these backup systems. Um, so just taking out one system is not going to work. So just right. you really have to like really mess them up. Seriously. And I hadn't really, I mentioned before, thought about all their senses, but I've thought about their vision, but hearing? So mosquitoes, <laughs> I've never, I guess I don't even think of that. Where are their ears? Yeah. Are they even on their... So the ears are actually at the base of their antenna. Um, so there's like this, if you ever looked at, you probably never looked longingly at a mosquito before, but if you look longingly at a mosquito at the base of the antenna, there's like this larger bulge kind of thing. And at the, that bulge is essentially the ears. And so the, the, the antenna can work, you know, um, as a way, as a pivot point at the base of the antenna. And so uh, there are mechanoreceptors, mechanosensory neurons at the base of the antenna that are essentially the ears. They're picking up vibrations, which you know, essentially is what sound is. And so all insects, you know, use the base of their antenna as ears. And so, for example, the male has a very sensitive, um, male mosquitoes have a very sensitive hearing. And so what they're picking up on is the wing beat frequencies of the female. And so um, they can actually, they're listening, they're trying to hear for that little wing beat frequency of a mos the female mosquito. And when they hear it, they could kind of zone in on where that female is. So they're very sensitive ears just to that wing beat frequency. Now how can we know that? How, that? And I mean, they have to differentiate between the the the, the beating of so many other insects of various yeah, sizes yeah. and their yeah, wings so, and all the all the possible sounds that are right. carried in the wind. Yeah, carried on. So the you air. can you can do like you know you can do an experiment where you're you're um, have a, mic a microphone that gives off this this frequency, and the male mosquitoes will <laughs> will fly towards the microphone and you know try to essentially mate with it because it, it thinks it's picking up on the wing beat frequency of a female. And you can also record from these mechanosensory neurons in the male itself. And you can see that uh, when the wing beat frequency is at the same, the, the frequency that it's hearing is at the same as the wing right. beat frequency of a female, these neurons are much, much more active. And so they're very, there's lots of mechanisms in the ear that makes them very highly tuned to this one particular frequency. It's like the other frequencies just they can't, it's kind of fuzzy in a way, you know, so it's only when it hits that right note, basically, that it becomes very sharp for them. And so and then it picks up on that. I, I guess that's that touches on a, a subject too, that, that some model organisms from zebrafish and larval zebrafish to, to these kind of, these simpler systems that sometimes also you're able to witness, see things that you can't really see in a human brain. Right. Because how do you see deep into the human brain, but but you can look into You can do that. And, and you can do like, you can like stick electrodes. So it's, which is essentially kind of like a, a very sensitive voltmeter. Um, you can yeah. stick that into the different tissues of an insect, you know, like into the ear, into the yeah. antenna and pick up on the electrical signals that are there. So, okay, so I'm going to ask you about vision, but, uh, and we'll talk more about scent, uh, but that's hearing. So we have taste 
and we tend to think of five senses. Or you're a neuroscientist. Is it still mm -hmm. fair to say we sort of humans have five senses? Yeah. That's, yeah. I think that's still the going theory. Yeah. It's fascinating that just here on Earth, when we try to imagine, speaking of science fiction, try to imagine <laughs> uh, aliens, and right here on Earth, we have examples of creatures with other senses that we don't have, mm -hmm. like sensing magnetic field lines or mm -hmm. or electric fields. or Right, um, right. So that, that's fascinating to me. Um, what do mosquitoes have that we know of? So do they have taste and they have to, Yeah, so... The taste is actually interesting because, you know, there's, they have like a, a mouth, so they have kind of like a tongue, um, but they also can taste with their feet. Um, so uh, they like have Like butterflies, these, right? Yeah, like butterflies, right. So when they, you know, so, so when they're flying and they land on you, they are, they're starting to taste your skin. Um, so they're starting to figure out, you know, is this, this is the kind of animal that I really want to be on. Um, and it's a way also to, you know, most insects use it for their food sources because they're, you know, essentially landing on a food source before they, they can feed. So having taste receptors on your feet, it's a pretty convenient place right. to put them. Makes sense. Um, and then, um, so taste and feel, I guess they it's, have it, it, some- They have, yeah, they have like uh, touch receptors. What do we receptors. call that? Touch receptors. Um, and, and then there's also like, uh, they're, they don't have like a sense of pain the way we do, but you know, they can pick up on, um, you know, if there's like a, a poke or something like that, they can pick up on that particular sense. Interesting. So vision, yes. I've had this, I've had this idea about insects that, that they're so tiny that they live on a different mm -hmm. scale from us. And that their world is is so small and immediate. Even a vast world is only a space of a few cubic feet or something. <laughs> so I've always had this idea that I've wondered, can a mosquito even see me or an ant from across the room? Mm -hmm. Or am I in some way? And how would we even know that? Right. I mean, I guess I can imagine you saying there's a way to tell if it does detect us, but... But if I if it was the what I was imagining, how would we even know? Where it's just like, I don't know. It just fades out as if there's a horizon. I guess that's what I right. feel like. Like there's a horizon to their awareness. Right. So I think you know they they to us if you're at a certain distance, they just look like a blob, uh, like a different contrast blob. Um, so uh, their they their sense of vision is not as great as ours. You know so. You know, it's not like when they see us, they see things like the same kind of resolution we can see things in. It's a lot more, um, a lot more pixelated, you can think of, but just, you know, not as much detail. So they're really picking up on blobs and contrast and kind of shapes that are in their environment. Um, so, you know, then, but then they can combine that, you know, what the, the blob that they're seeing, they can combine it with like, you know, am I smelling a human at this moment? Or am I smelling like a dog at this moment? You know, is it, you know, is once I get closer to it, you know, am I starting to pick up on humidity? Am I starting to pick up on heat? So it's, the insect is using all these senses at the, the same time to really come up with essentially a conceptualization of what that blob is that it's seeing. The blob essentially can use its vision to focus in on it and help navigate it towards a certain thing in the environment. But it really is using all those other senses together to really tell it what it's what it's doing interesting so this almost sounds like science fiction to me <laughs> um i've often heard that a moth can detect the mm -hmm. pheromones from a mate uh up to a mile away mm -hmm. that like just trying to mad like talk about compare that size thing yeah. it's the, so the opposite of what i just said it's that i'm thinking it lives on this little scale here and yet i mean i can't detect a mate a mile away and i have a cell phone <laughs> and, and and all this other technology <laughs> gps i can't detect a mate a mile away but how can this moth so if if that's true how do we know that's true so we, we know um, the receptor is that we know the, the neuron that picks up, picks up that odor. It's this uh, odor called bombacol. And so it's a very specific pheromone odor. Um, and so what you can do is you can figure out you know, what, you know, first you can see like if, you know, you can get like a hundred of these molecules and see, does that neuron pick it up? You can get down to one molecule. Is, can it pick it up? And this neuron is so highly tuned 
so sensitive to this to this molecule that you can essentially do like the you know back of an envelope kind of calculations and say you know the female gives off a certain amount of this bombacol you know if it was just to diffuse in air you know how far away would it get to the point where you can actually still detect that one molecule of it and that's like a mile away so just by knowing like the the response properties of these neurons and then just doing the calculations you can then say oh yeah so one mile away, that odor is still strong enough to actually activate these olfactory neurons on the moth. But that's remarkable. And you think a moth isn't very big for it to emit enough pheromones that a sphere right. with a radius of a mile, like that it would right. that it would spread and get uh, that. Well, so, the, so, so odors like they they're. They're kind of more like in these like plumes. So I think we always think of like odors as being like this kind of thing, but really they're kind of more like filaments. You can kind of think of them that way. They're like plumes. And so they're, you know, picked up on the wind. So you'd have like this kind of plume that is going downstream of the air and that's how they can pick it up. So it could be that it's not just like this diffusion that happens. There's always a little bit of wind somewhere. So there's like these tunnels, these uh, channels of odor. That's that's okay. That 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 makes sense, and that's very interesting. And one thing I picked up in reading something about moths yesterday is that that the scent comes to them on the wind. So this is an interesting. Like, so it's like I guess it's a simple algorithm. If you detect it, you head into the wind because exactly. it's coming to you from the wind. So exactly, right. are they able to detect? How do they know which way the wind blows? <laughs> <laughs> but it's just Literally. the same way we do. We put our finger up. We're like, exactly. so they have, they, they do it. They basically have these like uh, these hairs on their body that are essentially can pick up um, wind. You know, they're they can they're like mechano mechano sensors. They do a little so they can pick up. A they do, they're like, which way is it go? And they just point themselves in the right direction. But they're they're essentially picking up on essentially the wind. They can actually tell it on their bodies, and so they can always go against the wind. Wow against the wind. Wow, that's, yeah, that's kind of amazing. So now let, let me ask you about science fiction because I know that uh, like me, you are a big science fiction fan. And what sort of science fiction uh, did you, I don't know if it's what you grew up reading or what you like mm -hmm. now, but uh, what sort I, of stuff? I like to, I think it's kind of, a, kind of a large number. I think I always thought with like science fiction where, you know, it was kind of pushing the, uh, the the limits of human brain, human cognition. Like, yeah. uh, you know, it's like those stories where you, know, you could essentially download your brain and then right. upload it somewhere else. I think those stories were always very interesting. Like, I just watched called... one that I've been meaning to watch for a long time. It's called Selfless. I haven't seen with, that one. Yeah. With, um, oh, what's his name who famously played Gandhi? Um, ben Kingsley? Ben Kingsley. Yeah. And he's, and then Ryan Reynolds, I oh. think, is in it. He uh, seems like he's, he's in every movie these days. I know he's in everything. Um, I watched, I saw him. I'm, I like, yeah. I watched a time travel thing he's in mm -hmm. that just came out, The Atom Project. But um, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that kind of science fiction because that's there are. I wouldn't even ask you about. I, I wouldn't even ask a neuroscientist this, except that this trope is so persistent that it still exists in science fiction. And it's usually the science fiction where somebody is gonna become superhuman in some sense mm -hmm. or super intelligent. And they always say the thing about how we only use 10% of our brains. I've heard it suggested that maybe that came from, we didn't used to know what all mm -hmm. the brain parts were for but yeah do you know anything about that and how irritating is that to you as it's, a yeah, it's, scientist? It's, it's so not true yeah it's like completely not true we use all of our brains all of the time um yeah i don't i yeah i have to look into where that came from because it's yeah. just like it's you know it's it's a nice idea right that if you just could use your whole brain you'd be like a super genius but we're all super geniuses because we're always using all of our brains and it's the same you know for all animals this the, the, the idea that part of your brain is dormant or not being yeah. used at any time is i mean i don't, I don't know if there's truth to it but it sounds like an interesting explanation that like we didn't know what parts of it were for and it reminds me like in genetics there's that thing about all the parts of the genetic code mm -hmm. that we've been i don't even know it feels like do we not use the term junk dna anymore because not anymore yeah because it was like, like 
it didn't code for right. protein, so we thought right. it didn't do anything. But it's like it's there for a reason, right? Yeah. So like all you know. So what was so when I when I was an undergrad and a grad student, you know, the term junk DNA was essentially used a lot. Um, and now we realize that that DNA actually does things. So there's it can essentially be used to control the expression of other genes in the genome. And so there really is no junk DNA. I think, you know, I think that I like to tell my students that the genome is a very scary place. It's doing lots of things that are quite mysterious. Um, and so, you know, a lot of everything's getting used in some way. We just really haven't figured it out yet. Yeah. Um, so a lot of it's, you know, it's, it's this uh, extra, like, you know, those extra DNA is kind of used as like a, a hotbed for evolution. It's like a place where you can kind of tinker and tweak things in the genome. And maybe you'll get expression of a, a gene that wasn't normally expressed or increased expression of a gene, something like that. So, you know, a lot of that is like the hotbed for, for, for evolution. So it's, it's, it's really, it's actually still pretty important that it's there. And are there any other tropes or anything else you've seen in, in science fiction, um, either good or bad, I'll bet there's more bad than good, representations of neuroscience and genetic engineering, um, anything else you've seen in science fiction that... I don't, I don't know. I always just kind of like have to think, well, <laughs> I wish I wish I had that machine in my lab that right. can get your results in like five minutes. Um, I don't know. I always take it with a great assault, you know, like when you watch a science fiction show and, you know, they will do a test, like a PCR test or something like that. And they have the results in, in two minutes. And you're like, wow, I, I got to check with that biotech company and get that machine in my Hell lab yeah. because it takes us an hour to do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, I, think it's, it's... I remember there's so, you know, a real common thing. It's more a computer thing, but uh, in The Fly, the David Cronenberg film oh, yeah. featuring the remake with, with uh, Jeff Goldblum, an amazing right. film. I love that movie so much I like for reality, every too, reason. Yeah. And there's this, there's another thing computers do in movies a lot, which is it explains, it, it sums everything up in a way that a computer goes, like it basically says, well, it made it the, it, like it tells him what it did, like in a way that, right? yeah, oh, right. really? It just, you have you a conscious computer that, that summed it all up that way, yeah. Sure. Yeah, I think one, one thing that's kind of funny when you think about mosquitoes is that like in Jurassic Park, um, you know, they have like this mosquito caught in amber um, and that particular mosquito they show is one of the, one of the ones that it's like the, the largest species of mosquitoes. It's probably why, you know, they picked it, but it actually doesn't blood feed. It, <gasps> it's not a blood feeding mosquito that they, they're showing. So there's the whole premise for that. The whole premise for that movie is kind of like when entomologists or, you know, someone who studies mosquitoes see that they're like, mm, no, that's, that's not going to work. And there's all they had no... to do was show the right mosquito, right? <laughs> that's right. So it's like, yeah. Um, yeah. So that's, I that's, hadn't heard yeah. that. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Um, so is there a question you most want the answer to? Mm. Whew. Yeah, I think there's, you know, there's this um, topic that I think is becoming more prevalent now is something called gene drive. Um, it's like this, it's this like genetic technology that um, essentially can allow, you know, for insects, for example, for mosquitoes, there's this technology called gene drive where you could actually have the power now to set it up um, where you could kind of eliminate an entire species. So you could set up a gene drive mechanism, this genetic technology where you could say, okay, we're gonna start it in this small population of mosquitoes. It's gonna to spread to all this particular population of mosquitoes and it will it'll essentially kill them all. Um, and so I think there's, it's one of those, it's like we're at the, like the turning point for this. You know, we have this technology, it's very powerful. And I think the big question is, you know, should, should we use it or not, you know, do we know enough about what this will do, you know, how it will affect the ecosystem um, to use it? You know, it's, it's a very, you know, I think a lot of the viewers will think, you know, sure, let's completely wipe out. Why do we even need mosquitoes on this planet? You know, what purpose do they serve? And that's, you know, that's, a, you know, that's an excellent question. You know, um, they, you know, they can be a food source for, for birds. They can be a food, for, a food source for, for fish, you know, so they are part of the ecosystem. So, 
you know, now that we have this genetic technology to essentially like say, we're gonna wipe out this particular species of mosquitoes, you know, should we do that? Um, and so I think, you know, that's, I think that's a fascinating question because it, you know, um, it's really, we're at the intersection of, of the, the ability of us, uh, ability of humans to really affect things on such a global scale um, that I think we just have to be very careful about how we proceed. Um, I don't know if it's the good thing to do or not, you know, but I think we just have to take it slowly and to really think it through and to make sure that, you know, we are as smart as we think we are, that we, you know, we really thought about everything uh, before we, before we do this. That's the lesson of Jurassic Park That's what you're <laughs> in science fiction. <laughs> That's what I always think about when I think about Gene Drive is like Jurassic Park and there's like the Jeff Goldblum character is like nature always finds a way. Right. right. So. And just because you can do it, you know, should you right. do it. So. Do um haven't we already released some genetically modified mosquitoes so those, in a few places? It's using, it's using a different method. So there's like a, it's um, it's called a sterile method release. So you, what you essentially do is you sterilize males, for example, and then you release them by the millions. And so they're, they're not genetically modified in that particular sense. They're just usually like they're used radiation to sterilize them. And so you're just releasing essentially millions of sterilized mosquitoes. They'll still go out and they'll still mate with females, but they just cannot, you know, produce offspring. And so, so you know, by doing that, you can reduce the population of the mosquitoes. They use up a cycle of that female is yeah. mating with something that can't reproduce. But, right. but okay, I thought that they had been rendered um, sterile by some by some genetic method or something. Or like it's, it's yeah. there. I think yeah, there is like some biotech companies that have figured out like some genetic tricks to to make it easier because sterilizing by radiation makes them a little bit weaker. You know, they they're not as healthy as a wild type. Uh, mosquitoes so they don't and that'll well. affect so their chances of reproducing that'll affect their chances yeah. right because a mosquito likes a strong mate um <laughs> why wouldn't she but right. um okay th yeah that's interesting but i mean can't like the like say we do something like that and it's like yeah but we only did it to mosquitoes isn't it right. possible for genes to it's that's that's the thing we just we're just not sure you know how how to contain it you know i think that's where this next generation of gene drives will come in is like you know we have the concept we we could use it as is but let's let's think about it let's how do we put that genie back in the bottle let's engineer that into the next this the one that we might actually release you know to say well maybe we maybe we it didn't work out as well so can we like flip a switch and can we turn it off right so there's kind of a, a sexy topic in uh, amongst microorganisms and especially in felines and rats and mice about Toxoplasma gondii. This uh, is it a bacteria that it's, it, it's like, like a it's like a mold, um, like a parasitic mold. And so there's a, there's other versions of this throughout the animal world where a creature is like a parasite gets some control. Like there's the one in the ants that makes this certain ant climb up to a certain height and a certain direction, and then it clenches down on the <laughs> branch, and then the thing, the right. fungus, comes out of its head and spreads right. its pores from that high height. That right. kind of like, the way a fungus or a, a, a microbe mm -hmm. could possibly affect uh, the thinking and mo move the body, they call it, like, they refer to it like a zombie Mm -hmm. thing. Right, right. Um, isn't that, how bizarre? I don't even know what my <laughs> question is. I mean, I know it's true, so it's I'm amazing, not asking right? yeah. that, but it's yeah. crazy, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's also these types of things in flies as well, where this infection essentially um, hijacks the nervous system. And so what the fly will do is it'll actually crawl up onto a branch or a stick and hold on tight, essentially get like almost like rigor mortis as it holds on as it's dying and then this mold will erupt out of it and it's at the top you know it goes to the very height as high as it possibly can so that when this mold spores essentially erupts out of the fly it'll be able to disperse as far as possible um, yeah and then the one i mentioned toxoplasma gondii yeah. the, the, it gets inside um uh a rodent and instead of fearing the smell of cat urine, it's attracted to it. And it's like, it's not afraid of a cat. And and it's because Toxoplasma can inhabit a lot of mammals, but it can only reproduce 
inside of a cat. So it's its method for getting inside a cat. This is such elaborate, weird behavior. And people have wondered, Toxo, a lot of, there's a high percentage of humans that, that carry toxoplasma. And is that why I like Bohemian Rhapsody? If I'm a craving to hear Bohemian Rhapsody, is it be me or is it some parasite inside me? <laughs> How much control can they exhibit over us? Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I don't know. That's, that's yeah, I know. I'm not, that's not, I'm not asking for like, an answer. Yeah. How much control, Chris? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so this has been fantastic. And I want to like, I, 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 uh, I put up your Twitter handle and it's fly, it's punny. Uh, so you study mosquito and fly noses. So fly at fly nose, K-N-O-W-S. Um, so we can find you there on Twitter. Are there any other resources you would refer anyone towards? Uh, yeah, you can check out our website, um, potterlab.johnshopkins.edu. Um, okay. And so... Before we go, so tell me what you are working on now. You say, so I was just reading about your your latest research, but you're already on to the next thing. And does, it, the next thing, does, yeah. does it build on the, the previous paper? So it's it's kind of like, it's a, it's a separate story that we have. Um, so this is looking at um, Drosophila, vinegar flies, and mosquitoes, and to see how their olfactory neurons, um, how, how the odor receptors and how olfactory uh, neurons are expressed. Um, for the longest time, we always thought that an olfactory neuron only expressed express one kind of olfactory receptor and now we've identified that that's not not quite true is that you know they can actually they can actually express more than one at a time and so the paper that's coming out hopefully in a couple two or three weeks um, kind of goes into that and kind of creates a whole new model for how insect olfaction might be working yeah um and uh there were some comments that i didn't get to but regina says thank you both this was fascinating and it really was thank you so much is there uh, we've talked about a lot of different things. What would you want people to know about mosquitoes, mosquito olfaction, insect repellents, genetic <laughs> engineering, like in, in just like from your work and things we've talked about, what, what do you, are there some takeaways that you want people to know uh, from what you've yeah, learned? I think, yeah, I think we just really want people to know that, you know, that sense of how important the sense of smell is for mosquitoes. Um, and to kind of support, you know, research, basic research into that, because, you know, what uh, the whole goal really is to use our basic research to guide a mosquito away from us, you know, you know, so we could use them for traps. So we can figure out like, what is like a super attractive odor for a mosquito? Um, and we could use those for traps, like insecticide traps, or we could figure out like the, what's the, what's a super repellent odor to mosquitoes. We could actually use those as, um, things on our skin to keep them away from us. So um, I think, you know, be optimistic that hopefully in a few years we'll have this all figured out um, and that, you know, look look on your, your shelf for something from our lab. That would be fantastic. So thank you once again, uh, Dr. Chris Potter uh, from the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, uh, Department of Neuroscience and the Potter Lab. It's potterlab.com. Johns Hopkins.edu. Hopkins. Edu. Edu, yeah. Um, so thank you again. And uh, thanks, everybody, for uh, tuning in. This has been a really fun show for me. I hope it was for you. Um, let me pull this up. Our, uh, our theme song is uh, by Logan Whitehurst. You can find him at loganwhitehurst.com and also his find his artist page on Spotify. But um, tomorrow I'll be talking to Kat Warren. Uh, she has she trains cadaver dogs and for multiple purposes, archaeological purposes even. So we have some great shows coming up. Thank you everybody for your comments and um, we'll see you again really soon.